and, and cut these plants thoroughly apart to find the actual larvae. So here's a, an, an egg mass before it hatches. Here's an egg mass that has hatched out, and they eat the top part, leaving just the base. But I can count that. So I had an average of 57 eggs per mass, bar, about double what corn borer has. And there were some egg masses that did not hatch, and that's probably fungus again that has killed that egg mass. And when an egg mass does start to hatch, well, essentially 98% of the egg mass is hatched. So these, the, the egg masses hatch very well. If you look on the plant, where are they? So here's the days after hatch, 1 up to 28. And here's potential places for them to be. We have been told from the West that they concentrate on tassels. So they would be in this tassel area. Um, or, they, or they go up. Actually, that turned out not to be true. If there's any silk at all, some of them go down to the silk. So if you're spraying a cornfield, the ones that are up high are probably going to die. But the ones that have made it down into the silk, you may have to get better coverage or get down into the silk area to, to actually kill. And at, at five days, they're still up on the tassel if it's still fresh. But they rapidly, after 10 days, when this tassel dries up, they begin to move rapidly and they, they're all in the ear zone. And they're either in the axle near the ear, they're on the silk, they start to get into the tip, and eventually when they're big, they're in the side and in the ear tip. And a lot of them sit right between, it's hard for me to do because I've talked, this is, if this is the, the uh, here, we'll use this. This is our, is our little ear, this is the stalk, like that, and they sit right in that groove. And, and that, they would be very protected from insecticides. And then how, how big are they? I collected every larva I found. I measured its little head capsule under a microscope. That's how you determine what age a caterpillar is. I have a lot of fun, you can tell, when I, I do this stuff. <laughs> you know, this, this is the guys that just hatch out, and then they molt. And these are, the big, these are the big pig guys that eat a lot, and they're like over an inch long. And it takes, you know, about 28 days. And by the time you get to 28 days, you're getting these really big guys. And these sixth instar ones, they're going to drop off the plant. So after 28 days, you know, if you're beginning of August or middle of August, they're feeding until practically the middle of September there. And so you may be like working on the combine and not thinking about what's going on in your cornfield and surprise, you didn't notice them in the middle of August, but geez, by the middle of September, they're, they can be pretty bad. What's my time frame like here? Oh, you got 17 minutes. minutes. Okay. So as far as control, we have a couple of options here. Um, in the West, they use a threshold of 8% of the plants with egg masses. The egg masses are very hard to see, very hard, uh, uh, very easy to see, very easy to scout for. You walk along and you can pick out those, those egg masses right on the top of the, of the leaf. And, and they're fairly large. Um, and they use an 8% and they say that 95% of the tassels have to be emerged. So that's a threshold that comes out of the West. Um, I already, with Ontario in New York State and Ohio, decided to drop that threshold back to 5%, so 5 out of every 100 plants with an, with an egg mass. And that's because we thought the higher humidity might increase survival, you know, I, I didn't want to risk anything by being too high. Plus, to me, 5 is an easier number to remember than 8, which seems kind of random. So, uh, I think the 5% threshold, of show, I think I have a, a, a slide here that shows you a little um, experiment that I, that I did with 5%. And this whole thing about when are the tassels emerge and all that jazz, uh, forget that. Uh, if you find 5% infestation, infestation, and I kind of don't care when it is. So if you have corn that, it, that has a whirl and the tassel isn't starting to come out, I wouldn't wait to spray that because they can be in that whirl if they hatch. They'll go right inside and they'll feed on that tassel before it even emerges. They, they will survive. So in the West, they wait a seemingly a long time to see what happens. But I would say here, I don't want to take any chances. If you're seeing a field that's kind of short and it's delayed planting, but it's got 5%, and you call Martin or Phil and they go out and look at it, they're probably going to call me and I'm going to say, if you're at 5 or 10% of the plants with egg masses, let's just treat that and, and not, uh, and not uh, think about it too long. And I would use a pyrethroid. 
because they last fairly long. I don't really want to, you know, I don't care if it's Warrior or Asana or what, what Mustang or whatever. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, agonize too much about which one. I would just get something on, and then if there's some more egg laying or egg hatch occurring, that product will last 10, 10 or 14 days up on the plant. So this guy's actually spraying dry beans, but you know, this is a picture I had of somebody spraying. So this is a picture out of Ontario. Uh, the second way to manage this pest is with Herculex, which is the Cry1F corn. The yield guard type corn, or the genuity type of corn, uh, that, that only has the Cry1AB toxin, the Monsanto product, does not work. It just passes right through the gut, and they just poop it out, and it's, it, and it's gone. In fact, the, the, uh, the plots that I, that I showed you earlier, where I had pinned the egg masses on, that was actually Cry1AB corn. To keep the to keep the corn borers out, so if you're going to manage this uh, and and want to know what hybrids would actually manage this, it has to be the Herculex type corn, or you know, like a Smart Stacks that that is coming out. So the Herculex <coughs> gene it performs equal to an insecticide, maybe a little better, but Herculex was developed for corn borer, not for Western bean cutworm. So here is an isoline that is not BT. And here is the uh, uh, Herculex, and you still, it, it looks quite a bit better than the Isoline, but there are some feeding spots. And particularly worrisome are the ones that are right in the middle of the plant, which means that they've gone through that husk entirely and opened that husk up. So even though this is Herculex and it does very well, just be aware it is not 100%, and you still could have some quality issues later in the season if if uh, you had delayed harvest in the fall and it got kind of wet and kind of crummy out, you could get fungi starting in here and have a problem in Herculex and, and the Isoline as well. But it does reduce the, the damage. So the plot I had at MSU, I was only allowed one small bag of Herculex this year for a number of reasons. And it was originally a rootworm trial. Um, so I had the whole front of the plot was rootworm, and then I took my research truck one weekend, and I just cut it in half. I just drove across the plot a couple times, which was very fun, and I cut a front half that I pinned egg masses on at 5%. So this is the threshold that I've been saying that you should use. So we're not going to worry too much about rootworm. Obviously, the Herculex re reduces lodging and reduces root damage to a very low amount. But this is the western bean cutworm, the percentage of ears fed on. So the percentage of the non-Herculex ears fed on was 20%. So I've got 5% of the plants with an egg mass. By the end of the season, 20% of the plants have feeding. And that's because they wander up and down the row. Even one day after hatch, they move to the next plant over. And by five days, they'll move to the next row over. So they move from that point of that egg mass, and they may be on one plant and tire of it and feed on it, on, on that ear, and go to the next ear and mess that up too. So they don't just stay in one ear like corn borer does. They, they will wander. And that's why you get 20% of the ears with holes in them. And the Herculex was about 2%. two percent. It was significantly less, but it wasn't perfect. And here are some Herculex ears, just a put some perspective, these are from Ontario. These were tested, they are producing Cry1F, but you can see this is all feeding at the top with some fungus. So the Herculex is good, but it isn't perfect for Western bean cutworm, and I don't want you to have that and then expect too much out of it. Finally, for 2010, we have funding from the corn growers and also the Dry Bean Commission for some work this year, and we will uh, do that trapping network again with the free pheromone, but this year, uh, we're not going to enter all that data. We're going to have an online thing on my website. So you're going to have to have an email address to do this and use the internet, at least so you can get it on the site and you'll be able to put in your own numbers instead of calling us when we're not around or something. So if you're